This interview is being conducted on March 15, 2006 in Niles, Illinois at the Public Library. My name is Kate Wallachie. I am speaking with Mr. Albert Dominic. Mr. Dominic was born on September 9, 1918 in Wilkes Bar, Pennsylvania and now lives in Niles, Illinois. He learned of the Veterans History Project initially through newspapers um, and spoke to someone in Florida about it, but when he heard the Niles Public Library was doing it, he decided he wanted to share his things with us. He has kindly consented to be interviewed for the Veterans History Project. Here is his story. So I don't know if you want to start out with how you entered the military or if you want to well, uh, talk about it, what you it, think it, about. In, these, in this little brief that I'm going to give you, uh, I've written. Um, I was going to Wharton School of Accounts and Finance, and of course I lost my jobs. And <clears throat> came from a big family. I'm number 10 in a family of 11. And since I had no recourse but to join the service, I did that. I know my family didn't want me to, but I did. I enlisted in at Philadelphia in September. I can't remember the date, but it's it's in the writing that I'm going to give you. It says the 26th, 1940. Right, right. Uh, and uh, uh, they sent me to uh, Fort Jackson, South Carolina, right outside of Columbus, uh, South Carolina. And in that. Uh, in those days, we, don't, we lived in tents. They didn't have any barracks in the area, nothing like that. Everything was tents. And I was surprised that in the winter months, we had buckets of water in front of the tent for washing and shaving and things like that. And in the winter months, oh, there was ice in the buckets, so it was colder than I thought. But anyway, it was interesting. We. I went through the regular three months uh, activity uh, in training, you know, uh, firing range, and then uh, uh, di different uh, battle uh, field operations, things of that nature. And then I was signed to the service company because I had. When I was in high school, I felt I may never get a college education, so I took a business course so I could go to business school. Now, in other words, I could write shorthand, type, and things of that nature. So anyway, they, they uh, thought I would be good in a service company, so I did a lot of typing uh, and learning about ammunition and things of that nature. Well. Uh, they gave me a sergeant's. I was in, only in the month and a half, and I got sergeant stripes. But wow. I wouldn't get sergeant's pay because I wasn't in long enough. I had to be in <laughs> six months <laughs> for someone at the door. Someone at the door, We were at a, at the. Uh, anyway, I so I had to uh, uh, work, you know before I got my sergeant's pay. And uh, uh, I had a, a company commander, his name was, uh, it's, in the, it's in the book and it's in the story. And I can't think of it, I'm sorry. It's okay. But anyway, he's a West Point man, very military. Uh, he reminded me of uh, General Patton, he was a very, good leader, uh, the men liked him, uh, which you don't find too often in the military. And uh, anyway, he, he took me under his charge and through him I really got ahead in this service. I never expected to. But anyway, um, the captain told me to go to uh, First Army headquarters because of my ability. And uh, I went there and uh, then came back and he asked me if I got the position. I says, no, I didn't. So he asked me what I told him. And he, he made a remark that lived to me to this day and I've done it. He said, 
don't be afraid to tell some lies as long as you could support them with your ability. Mm -hmm. And I never forgot that, and I have done that. Well, anyway. Uh, Were so you concerned when you joined the service because the war was going on already in Europe, you know, because we weren't in the war, but the war I, was going on? I figured on? if I got in, I might be able to establish myself fairly well. Yeah. Uh, and I didn't even think of war, really, even though I knew what was going on in Europe. But anyway, uh, he, he became, uh, let's say, he sponsored me a lot. Well, anyway, I came back and began to work again. And the we went on maneuvers uh, in the Carolinas, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and uh, there's some funny things. But I think it's best if you read the stuff that I give you, because okay. uh, um, we were pulled out of in 1940. We were pulled out of maneuvers. Now the Japanese people were negotiating with the United States at this time. We were pulled out of maneuvers, and uh, any man who was 35 years and older was removed from our unit. Mm -hmm. And we got the new recruits from New York and New Jersey, younger, younger men. Were they all, were all the people in your unit from the, from the Northeast, or? A mix. Yeah. There was some, uh, from Tennessee, Kentucky, uh, uh, New Jersey, New York, uh, Pennsylvania, and one, one, one Southern, I think he was from Kentucky, we would be standing in line to do something, and he would fall asleep leaning against a tree. <laughs> I never <laughs> saw anything like this in my life. Or some of them would get a shot and they'd faint getting a shot, you know. Some, you know, everybody isn't strong enough. But anyway. <laughs> or uh, awake enough, I guess. Yeah. Uh, we received orders, and it's in the story that I'll give you. And it was a code word, plum, which we discovered later on was Philippine Islands. Now, I was going to the Philippine Islands before Pearl Harbor. Now, we crossed the continent in a train, a troop train, went through the Rocky Mountains. We stopped there a while with playing with snowballs and things like that. Uh, and we got to the city of San Francisco. Uh, there we uh, started to get ready to go ab abroad. In other words, we were loading the ship with our equipment, guns, uh, trucks, and whatever we were going to take. And we were going on a Matson liner, which was, uh, had a beautiful American flag on it. And you know, it, was a, it wasn't a troop ship, it was a tourist ship. Mm -hmm. And then at uh, December the 7th, uh, the troops were already on the ship, and I was told to stay behind and check, make sure that nothing was left behind, it was clean, things of that nature. So as we were, I was checking everything. One of my, my friends ran up to me, says, Al, Pearl Harbor's being bombed. And I said, oh, one of Orson Welles shows. I remember his show on radio that, you know, the, the, Martians, were, the, the Martians were attacking New Jersey. <laughs> and, and so I, I, you know, I laughed it off. He says, no, really? I said, okay, I'll come down. And we had a portable radio in another section of the barracks. So I went down there, and I could hear the bombs and everything else, and the announcers saying, the United States is under attack by the Japanese Navy. And uh, then I got word from the ship that we were, uh, the men were coming back to the barracks. Uh, with just the regular stuff. Every, the ship is going to stay and uh, be painted, battleship gray, whatever they did. 
So we were there a week, and uh, we boarded the ship. And of course, on the ship, was, uh, on the ship were some uh, 37 caliber guns and 50 machine guns mounted on the decks and things, of course, like that for our defense. And of course, I often wonder what the 37 million we would do. Probably couldn't sink anything. Uh, and uh, so we set sail. Uh, I can't remember the date. But uh, anyway, it was a week, a week or a week and a half after Pearl Harbor, and we were accompanied by six destroyers. Uh, we arrived at the Philippine Islands. We arrived at the Hawaiian Islands. And uh, we docked in the Honolulu Harbor, Oahu. They had the towers and things like that. All the, all the troops uh, left the ship. I had to stay on to check things that were being sent to other barracks, you know, all Schofield barracks, or wherever we were going to be put. So I didn't see anything yet. And. Uh, uh, it was very tense, because we were there just a few days before Christmas, a week before Christmas, and... Uh, well, you must have crossed fairly quickly. Oh, yeah. I think it was a... Uh, I think it was just about four or five days we crossed. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then I, after uh, all the loading was done, I got orders to go to Schofield Barracks. And uh, I got there. Uh, we had a jeep. So as we were traveling, we could see there were no homes bombed or any downtown bombings in, in the Hawaiian Islands, in Honolulu. Everything was military. So as we were approaching Hickam Field and Pearl Harbor, you could see the horrible destruction of the hangars and the planes and uh, the ships. We saw the, <coughs> the Arizona uh, sunk and then some other ships were laying on their side. And, uh, it was just a horrible experience. And uh, then we got into Schofield Barracks and of course my company wasn't there yet. The, they were in another area of uh, the island of Oahu. Okay, we were on the island of Oahu. That's where Honolulu is. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we didn't, we haven't eaten, so we were scrounging around, looking at, uh, see if there was a kitchen open. We found one, and the cook was there. He was waiting for some people, to, uh, some of his unit to come in, and we didn't have anything to eat, so he made us grilled cheese sandwiches on the hot plate of the of the stove. <laughs> We're good. And that was our meal. Uh, and then soon the troops arrived with all their equipment and uh, Honolulu was not lit up after that. It was very dark. The, uh, the barracks are open because it's in so warm country, it's a warm state. And, and it just screened, so you had to uh, be in total darkness. No lights were put on in the night at all. And uh, uh, it was near Christmas time, so I thought I'd play a joke on some of my friends. And <laughs> I found an old, some old uh, stockings, I packed some junk in, <laughs> and hung it on the end of their cots. So when they woke up in the morning, they saw it, but anyway, our Christmas dinner consisted of it looked like spam and rice. It looked like spam. <laughs> <laughs> and rice, and uh, that's, that's about all, and of course, bread. Oh, very festive. But, hmm? Very festive. Yeah, and uh, of course, the next thing we found out that the barracks were infested with bed bugs. What a mess. So we 
stripped all the mosquito, the mosquito netting over your bunk in the corners of the mosquito netting were just infested with bed bugs. So we got all that stuff, soaked it in gasoline and everything else, and we, every, everything, the beds were all out in the open and sprayed and so forth so that we could have a comfortable sleep. <laughs> it's a mess how they got, you know, they multiply very rapidly, very rapidly, horrible. Well, anyway, that was one incident. Then uh, the other, we, we didn't hear from anybody for almost three months. And some of the supplies were coming in, uh, food and that, uh, stuff like that. But one funny incident was happening that I witnessed, and I thought, I thought it was pretty clever how, how these things happened. They were bringing beer and some other stuff and food, and they were putting it in in warehouses that were camouflaged and hidden in the mountains. So some of these drivers would take a case of beer out and hide it. Well, someone who was in a in a barracks building or in in a shack somewhere saw them putting it there, so they stole it <laughs> from them. So, so the truck driver coming back and would never find his beard, would he? No. So, but anyway, uh, we began to do training after that, uh, what they called, uh, it was really uh, combat training. We would uh, take, uh, take hikes into the mountains of uh, Hawaii, uh, Hawaii, and your, the volcanic mixture of that island just tears your shoes to nothing. You're, a, you're in, we were walking in the mountains in na on narrow trails, and you would have to stick to the trails because down below were hundreds of feet of dropping, you know. And often the clouds would come over, and you're walking in clouds. Because you know they're they're not that high, but the you know the clouds are, are low, and uh, we would witness some some of that stuff. Was it very different? Did you did you um, you were from Pennsylvania? Was it interesting to be someplace just so? Oh yeah, it was different, totally different. The weather was different. It would rain. You'd walk in the rain. It didn't matter because in. 15 or 20 minutes, the sun would be out again. It rains that way in, in Hawaii, so it, you know, it didn't matter. And in those days, of course, the pineapple fields were, were, were full of the plants, and you could see how they picked them. Of course, today, they're mechanized. Mm, and uh, they also you know, raised a lot of uh, sugar cane, and uh, when they harvested that, uh, they would uh, they would have uh, tracks and a small small little engine pulling pulling uh, cars loaded with the uh, sugar cane to a certain area that they would then deliver to the factory. That you know, but they never wasted anything because some of the even from the pineapple they would make something for rabbit food and things like that. And so uh, while we were there, I visited, uh, you know, the pineapple producing uh, people, pineapple juice and so forth, which was interesting. Uh, and being, uh, I, I like to volunteer for things. And uh, so this, my uh, captain, this captain, my commander, asked if I would go and be a, an army observer on a, on a destroyer. And so I agreed. And uh, I went to uh, uh, Pearl Harbor and boarded a, a, a destroyer that was going out with a lot of recruits that were going for gunnery practice. So we went out of I would say maybe 10 miles out into the ocean, and then they would bring a, a silhouette of a ship in the distance, 
and the uh, recruits then would be firing the guns and so forth. Now, were those Navy recruits that were firing, or you're... No, no, Navy. I was, a, I, right, was a, I, was, I was an Army observer. Yeah, so you were an Army observer on a boat. Yeah, on a, on a military boat. So I went, yeah, you know, it was a good experience, but I'll tell you, I don't think I could be a good sailor. So as soon as I went downstairs to eat, uh -uh. <laughs> no, my stomach said no. So I came back up and... Uh, I talked to the captain, I told him I had a problem. He said, uh, I said, I'm not going to, I can't sleep downstairs. He said, well, you could sleep on deck. There's, they have a little room. It's like a repair shop. Mm -hmm. He said, you could stay in there. And uh, I did, and so the sailors would bring me the coffee and the sandwiches I never went down and bring me to eat. But it was interesting to see the, the Navy recruits uh, maneuver and practice. So what was your, as an Army observer, what was your role? Did you have to report about that? Well, yeah, I, I, I told, I told uh, the uh, captain who sent me out there uh, about it and so forth. They just, I imagine the, uh, the Navy wanted some observers so they could see, you know, how they maneuver. Because, oh. you know, we maneuver in the ground. Well, they maneuver in the sea, too. And uh, so it was a good experience for me. But while I was there, we did some other things, too. We, we hitched a, a ride on a bomber uh, that, uh, <clears throat> out of Hickam Field. They were, they were going on a, just a dry run. And uh, I sat in the, the bubble in the front. <laughs> you, you're like suspended in space. You know, the, the, the gunner, the, yeah. the front gunner had a bubble in front and there was a bubble on the back. And so my other friends were in the other ones and I s selected the front one and it was really <laughs> weird because you're like suspended in space. And then we, uh, we I, that was one experience we had that, that was over with. But uh, we, uh, then we moved from the... Uh, uh, Schofield Barracks to the National Guard section uh, of uh, the Hawaiian Islands, and it was in a little mountain area. Uh, the mountains looked very funny. We called it, uh, we, we nicknamed it, it looked like a pregnant woman. <laughs> and so while we were there, these uh, friends that I had from uh, my companions, war com uh, soldier companions, were uh, from New York, New Jersey. Some of them were butchers. Some of them were from the dead end kid areas. And it was a mixture. And uh, they were pretty clever kids. So what they did, they went to the they they found where the supply uh, depot is that supplies you with ammunition and food and so forth because we we. We were service companies, so we had to supply the food and clothing and all to the other members of the of our regiment. So they stole a portable shack. <laughs> and, well, yeah, they stole it. For what? The, the army steals. I stole. <laughs> I, we stole a lot. Anyway, they stole the shack and they put it up in the mountains. And we had our own club there. You, you heard about MASH? Well, this was very similar to MASH. And of course, the Italian guys, they would, they would know the meat cuts and so forth. And one of them could make spaghetti, so we would have good spaghetti dinners and things like that. And the, they would get the beer and the, the, the GI, the, the, you know, the cans, the GI cans were filled with, with the beer. And, we just sunned ourselves on when we weren't working, and we enjoyed ourselves. And then we so we, sort of a supper club resort hut then, mm -hmm. sort of a supper club kind of resort. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and of course, uh, then motorcycles came in for us, and <coughs> we were <coughs> everybody's trying to ride a motorcycle. <laughs> That's the first time I rode a motorcycle, but I didn't stay on long. <laughs> you have to be, you have to balance it very well. I, I wasn't a very good balancer. <laughs> but uh, uh, 
we would often go to uh, Honolulu, uh, the uh, Moana Hotel, is it? Where they broadcast uh, the Banyan Tree Court. The, the Banyan Tree is uh, a, the kind of a tree that will release from its branches to, to root itself. Mm -hmm. so, it, so, uh, so we were in that court and heard some good music that they were broadcasting to the United States. And we went to a lot of Honolulu uh, hula hula dances. But the first, the first affair that we had about uh, three months after we were there, they told us there was going to be a, 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 a big party, a, a big uh, show in the uh, Triangle in Schofield Barracks. So we came from our area in the mountainous area uh, from where we're at into the Schofield Barracks. And it was pretty crowded. It turned out to be <laughs> these women were all strippers. <laughs> and you should see them shouting and hooting and hollering with the you know, the soldiers, <laughs> most of the soldiers. And, and I don't know where that, where or who developed this show because there was never another one like that. <laughs> In other words, it wasn't, it wasn't a U.S. canteen show. I don't know. What, yeah, they were stripping and the guys were hooting and hollering and yelling. <laughs> you know, well, it was good release too for the guys, but uh, anyway, it was very funny. But uh, we would go, uh, the Navy took over the uh, Royal Hawaiian Hotel, and uh, we went there a lot when we uh, went to the, uh, uh, the city, to Honolulu, because they, they had little refreshments there and things of that nature. And. Uh, while I was in the in uh, in the uh, Hawaiian Islands, I, I took a pilot training test, and some of my other friends did to be pilots. They would ship us to the United States when if we you know if they if we passed and they recommended to us. So I did that, and uh, while there, I took a a test for a, a junior warrant officer. It's uh, it's a metal test, and then you appear before 12 military men for an oral review. Well, uh, Janicek and Kirby were, were uh, regular army. Well, so was I, but I was 22, and Janicek must have been 40, and Kirby must have been about 35. Well. Uh, what happened, uh, Janicek and Kirby were, became junior warrant officers, and I didn't pass. So what does a junior warrant well, officer do? It's strictly technical, strictly technical. Well, uh, I didn't pass it. I, I went before the board of these, uh, what, eight, 12 officers, and of course I'm 22, and you know, I was regular army too, but I was young, so I, I didn't pass. Well, Janicek didn't realize he was over age, so he was called before, uh, before the, the uh, <coughs> commanding officer in, uh, in, in our company, and he was told that they're going to have to take it from him. And he, he was an old timer, and he said he wasn't going to tolerate any young guy telling him what to do. Well, Janicek was of a Slavic race, well, so am I. So I understood his Slavic language when he was teed off and mm -hmm. cussing and everything. <laughs> anyway, he said he wouldn't tolerate it. Well, Captain Adams was this gentleman that I was talking about. Well, Captain Adams called me. Uh, to his office, and he asked me if I would like to be a warrant officer. And I said, "Well, I, I said I, I don't think I could pass. I said I, the, the mental stuff wasn't nothing, but I said, you know, I, I'm before this board of officers, 
and I'm 22 years old. So Captain Adams says, let me worry about the politics. Do you want to be a warrant officer? And I said, yes. The next day I was discharged as a staff officer, staff sergeant, and he enlisted as a junior warrant officer. What did Janice so politics think about that? works yeah. in the Army, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that's how I became a, a junior warrant officer. He was a major, major Adams then. He was a brilliant man. He became a, a general later on during the war. And, uh, and so uh, we got orders that we were, uh, we were now going to be, we were called what they called a, a, a bastard outfit. We were a 34th Infantry Regiment with no affiliation to a division or anything. They just pulled us out as a regiment to go to Philippine Islands. Well, we never got to the Philippine Islands. So, but they said that we would now join the 24th Infantry Division and we were heading for the South Pacific. Uh, so they had a troop ship, had a lot of military on, plus uh, plus baggage, whatever it was, guns and trucks and everything else. And uh, the service company was put on a Liberty ship that bound, uh, the Kaiser people built them. Yeah. They're very flimsy. They bounce all over the sea, <laughs> things like that. Must so, have been great for you. Hmm? Must have been great for you. Oh, yeah, I got seasick again. <laughs> and any, anyway, so the service company was put on this Liberty ship. I don't know the name of it. And of course, as we crossed the equator, they had these, they had these initiations into the Neptune or the deep or whatever they call it. And uh, the sailors, not, not the uh, service, uh, the military, uh, the army. And we, we experienced that. That was a lot of fun. But I'll tell you, three days after we were out, I got so sick and you know, we were on a Navy ship. They have beans for breakfast. <laughs> I never had beans for breakfast. And uh, so, uh, well, we had to eat, so we ate the beans. And uh, we got to uh, within the coral reef. By the way, we stopped at, uh, I think they pronounce it Pongo Pongo. And, uh, we stopped there because we had a Philippine freighter with us that could not travel far and had to refuel. So while they were refueling the Philippine freighter, uh, the natives came in canoes and were passing up fruit and we were, we were dropping money for them and things of that nature. But we couldn't land. And they wore their nice, bright, you know, whatever they call them. Like a yeah, yeah. And uh, after the Philippine uh, freighter was uh, refueled, then we continued our journey. And our ship, uh, <clears throat> I can't even remember the name of the ship, our ship left the, what would you call them? Our, our ship left the convoy, and we landed at Gladstone. Uh, British Columbia, British, no, not British Columbia, Victoria, is it? Right, uh, right uh, beyond the coral reef, and we were scraping bottom. You know, it was, it was a, wow. you know, the Liberty ship was low, and uh, of course the harbor wasn't deep, so the the big uh, military ships couldn't land there. They went to Brisbane, Australia. So while we, while we were up at the Gladstone, they, they put us into a, a, oh, a big area, tree, palm trees, all kinds of trees, and kangaroos running around, and all the strange animals. And uh, uh, we, had to, we had to establish a camp. <coughs> so we were building the, the tents and uh, structures and things like that. 
and while we were there, something funny happened. Uh, uh, one of the g gentlemen had to go to the John, and <clears throat> you know, they use a lot of creosote there, smells and things like that. And uh, he went into John. He came out fast. He was, he was smoking a cigarette and dropping it <laughs> <in> the next. <laughs> he almost burned his butt. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I guess he'll never smoke in the Creosote so no. uh, oh, toilet. But some of this thing, like anyway. <clears throat> pretty soon the troops came, and then we began to to uh, get ourselves ready for movement out to the, you know, New Guineas. We didn't know where we we're going. In the meantime, I was able to uh, contact the. Uh, Red Cross, because I heard one of my first cousins was nearby, so I went to visit him. Uh, he's deceased now, Frank Mudler. And uh, so I had a nice visit with him. And then when I came back, I got orders to return to the States for pilot training. Wow. <laughs> so, so that was another venture. We, uh, we, I had to go to Brisbane, and they took me to Brisbane. And I boarded a, a, what is similar to the 747 today, uh, except it had the uh, gasoline-powered uh, engines, uh, the B-24. It was converted to carrying mail and things like that. So uh, our first stop was at the Fiji Islands. And uh, there we got some more people boarding. and. Uh, our next stop was Christmas Island. I don't know how these navigators could find a piece of sandbar in the middle of the Pacific, but we were told to keep quiet because Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt just arrived and she's gone to bed. So we wow. said, okay. You know, so we had our coffee and our plane took off again for another seven hour flight. We landed at Honolulu. Then I boarded another flight and I landed in San Francisco. And we just, I decided, uh, we decided, there's three of us going for pilot training. And I decided I uh, like to visit San Francisco a bit. So I had some uh, dental problems. I went to uh, the dentist there and met some nice people and they showed me around San Francisco and I was a wonderful you know, dinner and things like that. And then I uh, had to take another plane to uh, Santa Ana Air Base in uh, in the uh, lower part of San Francisco, uh, lower part of uh, California, just south of uh, Los Angeles. Oh, well, after about three months, I washed out. I can't remember why. It's, it's been so long. So I wanted to go back to the Pacific, and they said, no, you can't. So I joined uh, the 304 304th Combat Engineer Unit in Salinas, Kansas. And I thought Chicago was the windy city, but, <laughs> but Kansas was just as bad as it's blown all the time. And those barracks were not built good. You could hear the wind whistling through them and everything else. And so I stayed there a month or so. This was in 19, what, 1940? I can't remember. There's more in the writing. 40, anyway, maybe? anyway uh, uh, I joined the combat engineers. We went to uh, uh, de de uh, maneuver in the deserts in Arizona and California. And uh, they said we were going to go overseas, but we didn't know where. And I figured, well, if we're doing de desert, we might go into the African desert. But it turned out, no, they, after the maneuvers, we, uh, they, we were sent to Fort Dix. And uh, at Fort Dix, then uh, we got ourselves ready for uh, Europe. After that, uh, we sailed on uh, the, a British uh, troop ship, 
And they, for breakfast, have uh, herring or something else, fish. <laughs> I don't eat fish enough for breakfast. Anyway, I didn't get seasick on this ship because it was big. Okay, it didn't rock and roll like the others. So we got to uh, our base in uh, England. Um, it was near um, Edinburgh, uh, somewhere. And uh, we stayed there until uh, August sometime. And in August, we were sent down to Southampton. And from there, we sailed uh, to the Omaha Beachhead, I think. And uh, that was uh, a month and a half after the troops landed. And when we arrived there, uh, we were told to stay within they, they had white, white tape uh, put in certain areas so you wouldn't go over in that area because there were still landmines that they didn't clear. And uh, it, uh, it was kind of cold. And uh, we stayed in this bivouac area waiting for, you know, special orders. So we were assigned to uh, General Bradley's first army for a while, and uh, so then. So what was your job? Hmm? What was your what was your responsibility? Uh, then I was now a senior warrant officer. Mm -hmm. So what did you have to do? I was uh, still technical. I I had to order all the demolition, the bridges that they built, and the boats and things like that, and, mm -hmm. and supply the the entire division with the uh, engineering equipment, and. Uh, uh, it, it's still supplied, but I was a, I became chief warrant officer. But that reminds me of a story. I'll go back while we were getting ready in the states uh, to ship out. Uh, my captain had to go ahead to England to get our place ready, and I had to take care of all the logistics for the entire division for engineering stuff. Well, I was alone. I asked for help, and they would help send me first or second lieutenants that just would put their feet on the desk, and I didn't care for that. And I, I told them off. <clears throat> and so I called the colonel. I said, if you don't give me a, a person, I can't do my job. And so he sent me a wonderful lieutenant that helped me a lot. But while there, I sent all my clothes to the dry cleaner, so I had clean clothes to ship when I go overseas. The colonel sent a man to tell me that I have to take pictures. I'm a staff officer, so I have to take pictures with the staff. And I called the colonel back and I said, I'm sorry, I can't because I have no clothes. I sent all my material away. He said, oh, he said, I'll send someone over. So another gentleman who was built like I am, who was the first lieutenant, gave me his outfit <laughs> to put on to take the pictures. <laughs> and so I did, uh, I did uh, pose for the pictures. I don't know where they're at now because I never saw them. But anyway, I wasn't afraid to tell anybody off. And, uh, for example, during our war in Europe, <clears throat> this <coughs> uh, A, was it, Third Army uh, uh, officer, he was, a, he was a lieutenant colonel, he would ask for some material, and I gave him that, and I would always give <coughs> German stuff, because German equipment you could use, you know, some way or other. So one day, he called me, he said he didn't want any German stuff anymore. And I got a little teed off, of course, I always address him, sir. And so uh, I said, sir, I said, when I become Jesus Christ, I'll create this <laughs> American stuff. I can't do it now. <laughs> and the next day he asked me for something special. I said, okay, I'll get it for you. I contacted the Signal Corps officer because he wanted a phone. And he had plenty of phone. So I asked this buddy if, <clears throat> if we could barter something. 
And he said, yeah. He said, I'll give you this if you give me that. So he gave me the, <clears throat> the phone, and I gave him some uh, engineering equipment. But we stole a lot. I stole a lot from the supply depots. And I never got caught, but the guy that controlled the supply depot saw me one day. He said, one day I'm going to catch you. I said, you got to run faster than that. And then we would go through the back with them. We would, our guys would take what wire we needed and all that stuff. We stole a lot from our own people. Did you feel really responsible for the people you were supplying? Did you yes. Feel, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. When in the Battle of the Bulge, uh, a young soldier came down. Of course, I never wore my insignias. They didn't know who I was. In other words, I looked like a private. I never wore anything. Nothing. On purpose? Yeah. That's what I didn't wear anything. I didn't want to get shot my own man. <laughs> any, any, anyway, this young uh, sergeant came down and he, he said, you know, he said, my captain needs this ammunition and, and some of these engineering uh, things. And we do have sufficient, but we like extra because of the Battle of the Bulge. They might need it. So I uh, and he said, uh, he said, I heard that Dominic is pretty tough. <laughs> he didn't know. And so. So what did you say? No, I didn't say anything. I said, so let me see what you need. And uh, I had plenty of supplies. So I gave him what he needed. And of course, I have, uh, he has to sign everything because it's, you still have to sign for things. And so uh, he signed it, and then I signed it. And I said, I'm Dominic. <laughs> he just looked at me, his face dropped. <laughs> But uh, anyway, that's, that's some of the stuff. Uh, and of course, we, uh, we, we did some things that uh, military would do any place. The American has an ingenuity to do things and make things that uh, surprises you. Like these, um, the, the men, uh, if, if uh, we're able to get a different kind of food. We would, like they would shoot the deer, and we had venison. And we came across a trout fishery in uh, Aust Austria, and uh, uh, we bartered for some fish, and we had uh, trout dinners and things of that nature. So, and uh, another thing that uh, we had some good men that uh, were good mechanics, and we ran across a a uh, huge German uh, uh, diesel generator. It was on a big bed truck. And they checked it, and they found out they could, it could function. So we carried that <coughs> big diesel uh, power, I call it a powerhouse, with us. And we would plug it in, and we'd have lights in every house we went. <laughs> Did you find the people, did you see um, regular people when you were in Europe? Because you, you really went through a lot of Europe. Oh, yeah. Uh, we saw, uh, like, uh, we got acquainted with uh, some uh, Polish people that were slave laborers. In other words, they worked the farms and they only got room and board. They didn't get any money. And uh, uh, the young lad, he must have been about 12 or 13. He said his mother would wash our clothes, you know, and, and our payment would be food. So that's what he did. He would take our clothes and his mother or his sisters or whoever would, would uh, do it, wash them and dry them and brought them back nice, clean, and we would then give them some GI food, uh, whatever we had. And so we barred it all the time. We didn't give them money. The money is no good. Mm -hmm. In fact, the money that we used was uh, uh, money that the government issued. It didn't even look like our dollar mm -hmm. bill. And I don't know. I don't know what. I had some samples of that, but I don't know what I did with them. But anyway, when the the war was near its end, we were near uh, Linz, Austria, a beautiful place. Uh, 
uh, gorgeous lakes surrounded by the Alps, the Austrian Alps. But that water was ice cold, very cold. Couldn't stay in there too long. And we played ball and went into the mountains and saw that the war was over then with, uh, with Germany at that time. Uh, there's more, but I think if I, if I give you this 30 or 40 pages, you could look at it and we could tell you a little bit more. How did you um, keep in touch with your family, or did you keep in touch with your family? I wrote. I wrote a lot of email letters. They went the fastest. And the pictures that I gave you, we were authorized a photographer in the Engineer Corps. And uh, any time he, he had extra copies, he would give me them. And I didn't send them home because I know they'd be confiscated, so I wrapped them in waterproof container and I carry them and hoping I would get home and eventually I did and uh, that's when I put them in the book. They're, they're amazing, your pictures. Yeah. You also, do you have pictures that you took or pictures that friends took as well? Or uh, all? No, I didn't keep, uh, there's very few of those. The few that's in the book, that's about what I God, some of them, uh, some of them pick up cameras, you know, in, in the war you pick up something and, and if you could, it works, you use it. Um, but I, I, I didn't have my own personal one, no, but everybody else uh, carried something. It, it, it was an interesting experience. You also have some photos that, um, did you have some photos that you picked up from someone's, from a, did you say a Oh, German yeah, soldiers? yeah, yeah, the, uh, I saw a, uh, it, it, it's like a um, it's like a knapsack or something like that, it, and uh, it was laying during one of the battles, and I picked it up and looked at it, and there were some photographs. <coughs> uh, I don't I don't know who the soldier was. He was a German soldier, so I picked up the photographs because they were they were photographs of the uh, uh, par apparently a Russian. Uh, when, when Russia was being invaded by Germany. So they are more of the Carpathian Mountains and the Black Sea in that area. So I took them just, uh, just for memory. Yeah, for it's memory. very interesting. Yeah. It's very yeah. interesting to know they've, they've yeah. come here. Well, I'll tell you, it's <clears throat> uh, I only experienced, I experienced a lot of stuff, but uh, when the Battle of the L.A. Gap happened in France, and we went uh, to investigate, and some <laughs> Americans are no different than anybody else. They'll, they see a ring on a dead man's finger, they'll cut it off or take it, but I, I'm not that kind of person. And, uh, um, well, you could see the dead horses and the dead people laying, and you could, the smell of death is the worst thing. And it, when you get it on your car, it lasts for weeks until it, di it dissipates the air. And so we, <clears throat> we got to Newsy, and we, I became lost with this other young man. <laughs> and we, we figured we, we should go in this direction. So we were going, and we came across a, a German installation for, because uh, it had a Red Cross on for, you know, a hospital. And the building was stacked with dead German soldiers, so we knew that wasn't the place for us. So we finally spotted our the jeep that was waiting for us in a distance, and we yelled and all. It was already starting to get dark, and they heard us, and they turned around and came back. Otherwise, we'd have to walk a few miles back to camp. Yeah, because, you know, you're... You're not in a tent anymore. You're just in the truck. You sleep in a, uh, any which way you can. Uh, I remember when, uh, when we were down in mostly the southern part of, uh, of uh, France and we heard about the Battle of the Bulge, our unit had to move fast. See, I'm skipping a lot. I hope it doesn't matter. We don't care. Uh, we had to get to the Battle of the Bulge area fast. So we must have rode about 
12 hours and stop <clears throat> in the day one day just to get make ourselves some warm coffee. And uh, a, a chap would stop by to ask us how we're doing. And we said, it was okay, we'll, get, we'll run some coffee to keep warm. So he offered us some altar wine. <laughs> we had some altar wine with our coffee. <laughs> He's a nice chaplain, nice guy. And we thanked him for it. Uh, so things like that happened. But uh, it, it was very funny. I never, I never saw a USO show in all my army days, wow. except the strippers in Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> so, and they were in U.S., so I don't know who they were. But, uh, no, I never saw one. Uh, the only ones that I heard, Marlena Dietrich appeared with a woman that played an accordion. And I had duty that night, so I could hear the music and all. In the, they were, our unit was in a factory, so they were in the factory and they heard the performance. But Marlena Dietrich, and she had a woman with her that played an accordion. So what, were you, what did you have to do? Were you I, that I had night? duty that night. So, you know, I had to, in case something happened, I would have to alert everybody. So what did you, did, were you sitting somewhere? Were you? Yeah, I was, I was in, the, uh, in the factory office. I couldn't see them, but I could hear everything. Mm -hmm. So just. And, and you know, some, sometimes your own men could be dangerous to you, like this uh, one southern uh, lad. Uh, he had to go for some supplies, and, uh, and he came. Uh, he came to uh, the factory. This is the same factory that I was talking about. And uh, he must have got, uh, must have bought some booze. And some of the booze that they, they pick up could be very powerful. Mm -hmm. So this one southern soldier, he, he drank it, and then he had his gun. He was going to shoot somebody. And so I, I was trying to talk to him I, while my sergeant was getting, you know, while I was talking to him, distracting him, uh, my master sergeant was getting around the back of him to disarm him, so he got him disarmed. But uh, we, didn't, uh, we didn't press charges against him. We decided that he just was drunk. And so the guys put him to bed. Things like that happen. Mm -hmm. You never, you know, you, ne you never know. Your own men could shoot you. They don't like you. You never, you never know. So do you think that people like you? Mm -hmm. Well, I wasn't, I wasn't an officer and I wasn't an enlisted man. So, for example, to show you, I, even at, uh, when I worked with people, when I worked uh, with the airline, uh, I, I wasn't a company man. I was more the people. Well, anyway, uh, for example, one Christmas Eve, we were in we were in Germany somewhere, and uh, this captain called me because I had a lot of booze with me. When my captain was killed, he had a lot of old weapons and booze. So after captain uh, after captain was killed. I took the booze and let any, anybody who wanted the guns take the guns. So I, I had the booze uh, during the war, and here was a cold Christmas Eve night, so the officer called and he says, he, sa he said, I know you have a lot of booze. Could we have some? He said, we can have a party. And I said, oh, because there were some, uh, some American girls, what did they call them? They were there, there. Not, they weren't wax. They were part of the Red Cross, I think. Anyway, they had invited the girls to a party. And I said, well, am I invited? They said, no. I said, no booze. <laughs> so I gave the booze. I gave so much a bottle to every four guys so they could have a good Christmas Eve, and they did. 
So that's the kind of guy I am. But when I work, when I, uh, well, this shouldn't be on. When I worked for United Airlines, they called me Uncle Al, and the bosses didn't like it. Why would they care? Well, they, see, I could never become a manager because I was more with a people person. I wasn't a, a, a company person. I was a people person for the company, but. So in the <laughs> Army, did you meet a lot of people? I, I'm always curious, you know, being from Chicago, I'm always curious whether you meet a lot of people of different ethnicities or from different parts of the country and whether that's different from when you were at home. Well, no. Uh, well, I'll tell you, when I, I was young, uh, I suppose mostly influenced by my mother because my mother used to bake 24 loaves a week of bread. And I know when, when she baked them and, uh, and I was playing with the kids, she'd call them all in and give them a, a slice of bread with a lot of butter on it. And I think from that, I learned to, well, let's say, People, you know, I, I, I make friends easily, and uh, uh, I like to do things for people, and uh, maybe that's where it comes from. See, when I worked, we worked as a team, and when my group, we, when we had a problem, we uh, sat together and tried to resolve it, and whoever had the best solution, we would accept and try it. It didn't work. See, because I was in computers and with United Airlines, and I designed all, a lot of their accounting software packages. And so th that's the way we would do it. I didn't say mine is a better idea than yours. I didn't do that. So, uh, and then I, I was honest with them, things of that nature, I never backstabbing and things like that. Do you think that you uh, learned some of some of your people skills in the army in in working with people like that? Oh yeah, I think I did. I think I, you learn you learn lessons about life from everybody you meet. And I I'm a person that uh, likes to help people. See, I uh, right now I I visit a. A, a man a year older than I am who's losing his eyesight, ear sight, and so I could only converse with him. And he tells me all about the old stuff. He can't tell you much about new stuff. And he he has a, a problem. He has no friends. Uh, he he's the type of person that, well, if they don't call me, I'm not going to call them. And I don't. I told him. I said. You, Jerry, you shouldn't be that way. I said, uh, there's an old saying that no man is an island. I can't remember who's, who made the uh, quotation. John Donne. Hmm? John Donne. Yeah, I, I said, no man is an island. And I said, you're, you're not a, you, you don't want to talk to your elders because they don't talk to you. You have to initiate something. You can't be a lonesome guy and he has he has no friends I have a lot of friends well he has you hmm? he has you oh yeah oh yeah, yeah. so when the, when the war ended you were in Austria did you say yeah when I was not in, in so how did you get back home or when did you get back well uh, I got home uh, what the uh, when the war ended there was a, <coughs> a general order sent that anybody any soldier who had so many months or years overseas had to be sent home first. So I had, uh, I had a year and a half in the Pacific and I had a year and a half in Europe. So I had three years of service. And because I, uh, uh, for service, you got a yellow stripe to put on your, the sleeve of your coat. So I had six of them. Yeah. And anyway, uh, so then they shipped me to a place in Germany. Now I was, I was no longer uh, with the unit. I was just baggage going. <laughs> and anyway, 
we got to this place near near where Hitler was born. I can't remember the town. And uh, I, uh, they told me I could, uh, there's a, a home that I could sl uh, sleep and get room in. Uh, I didn't sign the papers yet, so I went up there and the only room, to, the only place that was available was a porch. Well, two lieutenants came by and they said, you they said, you can't stay here. I said, why not? No, no one's using this, the porch or the bed. They said, you can't stay here. I said, okay, I won't stay here. And so I was in a lineup and for food, you know, uh, canteen, cup and all like that for coffee and food. And I was talking to some of the guys and an Austrian was standing near us. And he said, I could get you a place to sleep in. I said, I said, okay. I said, uh, let me have, uh, could you, I'll, I'll have to get the papers for you. So I got the papers and signed it. There's big apartments house. So uh, there was a lot of uh, families living there. Uh, very few men, because most of them had gone to war. There were Germans and other nationalities. So I, Found, there was a two-bedroom apartment that they gave me and a German woman whose husband was missing. She, you know, she didn't know where, where he was and couldn't speak too much with, you know, to, to me, very little. But she's a wonderful woman. I, uh, I, I don't know why she did this, but when I'd come back in the, in the evening to go to bed, she had my shoes polished, my suits pressed, and everything else. And I would bring her food. I'd bring her food. Uh, what, what I didn't eat, of course, I, what I ate, I uh, threw away, and then I would get a second helping, and I'd bring it. And then she said there were Polish people living upstairs, so I met the Polish people. And I could talk a little bit Polish, and I could make them understand. So. We had a nice, uh, uh, now I don't know what the other people thought about it. I was in a building with all women. <laughs> and I didn't give a hoot. <laughs> yeah, you, you don't know how these people talk. They talk. Anyway, that was, and uh, so uh, then from there, they shipped me to uh, Le Havre, France, and I boarded a ship and set sail and uh, landed in New York, and then they shipped me by rail to Indian Town Gap in Pennsylvania, and I was discharged there. They wanted to know if I wanted to join the, the uh, reserves or anything. I said, no. I said, I had another, enough of the, uh, of the Army. I said, I believe in life, liberty, and the pursuits of happiness, and the Army doesn't give that to me. <laughs> so I, I didn't join the reserves. But uh, I, when I got home, I told my folks I was going to go to college. My, I, I'd send money home. Mm -hmm. My mother would buy things for herself, for the, you know, family, and she would uh, put the others in a saving account for me. So I had enough at least to cover a couple years of college. And so uh, I. Uh, I couldn't get back to University of Pennsylvania. They required a language, and I didn't have a language. So I contacted Ryder College at that time, then now Ryder University, and they were in Trenton, New Jersey at the time I entered them, uh, their institution. But now they have a big campus at Lawrenceville, uh, New, Jer Lawrenceville New Jersey, outside of Trenton, and huge, it's a beautiful place and now they're a university. And so I, got, I took accounting courses in there in Spanish. I was hoping to go to South America, but never got there. And uh, anyway, I, uh, uh, it was difficult getting a job after the war. How come? Well, my age, I was now 25, and I was told in New York City could I take orders from an 18-year-old boss? Oh, yeah. And so 
I did, I worked out of New York City for Haskins and Sells with Sense of Syracuse as an auditor. I did auditing for them, but that only lasted for about three or four months because of, uh, you know, income taxes. Then I uh, uh, took a bus cross country and I visited some of my army friends and got to, uh, uh, where did I wind up with? Uh, I wound up with uh, um, an aunt and uncle of uh, an old army buddy in, uh, in was San, not near Claremont, California. And they were wonderful to me. So uh, their, uh, their uh, nephew had married uh, and he was living in Laguna. On La in Laguna, and so <laughs> I went to visit him. His wife came, and <clears throat> when I met her during the war, she was on the pump side, you know, and she was in real estate. She must have made a lot of money. Now, when I saw her, she trimmed down very well. Had red hair. She had black hair when I met her, <laughs> and she had a a. a a Packard, a, a, it was an expensive car uh, with the kind that you put the, the, the uh, what do they call them? Like a convertible? Convertible, she had a convertible. It was a chocolate colored car. I can't remember the name of the car. And the, the, she took me down to meet Gar. English. That was the the buddy I had in in overseas Pacific, and uh, I looked around and there was a job in the uh, in one of the uh, yachting clubs. But uh, I find out that uh, after Friday they're they're all partying and drinking, and that wasn't my kind of lifestyle. So I went to see another buddy in Claremont, California, and he there didn't have any openings. He worked for a bank, I think. Uh, I don't know, it was Wells Fargo or one of those. So I decided I'd better come home and uh, do something about it. Uh, I did come to Pennsylvania, worked a little bit. It wasn't. I couldn't support a family like that if I ever got married, and now I, I was approaching my 30s. And uh, so I asked one of my brothers if uh, I could get on the boats. And he said, sure. So I went to Philadelphia, got my seaman's papers and, uh, and passport, and I worked on the Great Lakes for four or five months as an able-bodied seaman. <laughs> Then I landed in Milwaukee, called my cousins in Chicago, told them my problem. They said, come on and see, see what you could do here. So I came to Chicago. I found a job with United Airlines and stayed here. So that's how you ended up in Niles, huh? Mm -hmm. Did you join any veterans organizations ever? Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, a member of the, of the uh, Park Ridge VFW. I've been there. Not, I haven't been there too long. I'm not. I'm not a drinker, so I don't. I'm not a bar. I, I do not like to sit at a bar alone. Period. You know, I. I, I wasn't brought up that way. Never. Oh yeah, I had. I, I've been in saloons and things like that, but never. I never went to sit alone at a bar and just drink. So did you, did you, you said you were looking for a job so you could support a family? Did you get married? Did you? Oh yeah, I, I met my wife Edith, uh, uh, working with United Airlines. She worked in uh, another department, and I met at the picnic. She's a good dancer. I'm a fair dancer, and I enjoyed her company, and I'll tell you one thing she always would bring up to me. On our first date, I had, I had cousins that raised uh, schnauzers at that time. Not the miniature, but the next size. And uh, her husband was a fireman. He's retired now. 
and uh, uh, she called me one day and she said, Al, she said, I need some help. Mark, um, Mike is, has duty and, and the puppies uh, need some attention. I says, okay. Now I, so I, <laughs> I called my wife to be and I said, I said, Edith, I said, could I cancel this date and we'll have one next week? And I told her why. I said, I have to help my cousins give the little puppies suppositories. <laughs> <laughs> and I did, she put it bring that up to me. She said, <laughs> really, that's what I did. I would bring that up, that's pretty funny. <laughs> That's what I did. And, uh, and so we had a dates, and after that, and uh, I think it was within a year, uh, I, did, I asked her to marry me, told her father and mother. And uh, she was good, wonderful woman. Wonderful. She was very athletic, more athletic than I am. Because she would, uh, my, I'm left-handed. So I can't teach my son too many. I couldn't teach my son too many things. But she used to play ball. You know, during the war, she was in these women's uh, ball, ball team, baseball team. Really? Oh yeah. That's she could sh whistle. I couldn't whistle like that. She must have had some interesting very, stories very, as well. Very, very small woman, about five six. Nice dresser. Very, very outgoing. She had girlfriends that formed a club when they were in high school. And they got together, stayed together, they got married. And uh, finally when I married her, then they started having the husbands come to the meeting. So we would meet once a month, go out to dinner and things like that. And we still do. There's uh, what, one, two, Two widows. One is uh, in a nursing home now. The third one, she's got Alzheimer's. And there's uh, a couple still together. And then Tony and I are widowers. We still go out. We're supposed to meet before I go to Connecticut. You know, a, 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 you know, a theater and dinner type thing. So did you, um, did you talk about the war? Did you talk about your experiences when you came home? Not too much. I, I, I put the pictures together. I showed that a lot. Uh, I didn't uh, write anything or tell too much. I told some funny things that happened uh, and some bad things that happened, uh, but not, uh, not too much. So it didn't bother me, really. When did you write down your, your... Well, my son, it was a couple of years ago, my son said, Daddy said, I don't know anything about my relatives. Could you tell me something about them? I said, okay. So I wrote, uh, and this is part of them. The, what, I, what, I, what I'm going to give you is part of them. And uh, I told him about... Uh, being the tenth child, and my father uh, uh, named me Andrew, and my mother didn't like Andrew because it was her brother, and she didn't like her brother. So when I was baptized, I became Albert. Mm -hmm. And so then when I was getting confirmed, my mother said, man, 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 baby, you better take Andrew. <laughs> I said, Mom, I'm Andrew Albert Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> Make something. Well, the same with my wife. She was Margaret. Her mother was Margaret. So her middle name was Edith. So she used Edith because, you know, bank accounts and all. Mm -hmm. Because her brother, who is still living now, uh, he, he's Bill Cannon. His father, Bill Cannon Jr., his father was Bill Cannon Sr. Well, some of Bill Cannon Jr.'s checks would go to his father's account. Oh, no. Yeah, because you know, even so, uh, so uh, my wife was the same way. She had to make sure she put, uh, she used Edith, her middle name, instead of, 
and I, uh, I was Albert all the way through the war and all like that, uh, just to show you how you could cheat. Remember I told you the, the Major Adams said, you know, you could tell a little lie as long as you could balance it up. Because I was disappointed everywhere I went, now I was, like I said, I was 26 going on 27. And I'm, I, I'm not kidding you, they, I, I was too old. I had an edu education, but you know, could I take orders from someone 25? You know, I told the guy in New York when he told me that, I said, just forget I was in the war, I'm, I'm 20. And uh, so what I did, you're the only one that knows it's outside of my family. Uh, I said, what am I going to do? So I took my birth certificate. I slowly removed 1918. The 19 was all right. I substituted 2-0 for the 18. And I, that's what I supplied United with. So really, I worked till I was 68 instead of 60. And United still doesn't know it today. We'll and have I, to leave it out of the transcript. No and so when, I, so when I got the, when they gave it me back the, uh, my birth certificate, I changed the 18 back to 20. <laughs> you know, I, that was in my mind. I said, you know, what if they, you know, and I didn't have any experience yet. But when, when I got there, I was a good worker and I produced and I progressed when I, uh, to tell you that, you know, I wrote a little bit about life, and I called it life is a challenge, and it is. It doesn't work for everybody. Uh, I, I'm about to relate something that happened. That's why I wanted to show you that uh, it's a challenge, and you have to face it and just fight back in any way you can. Uh, I was with United for some years, and uh, any time new equipment came, I was always left with the old equipment to work. And oh yeah, I'd go to IBM schools and things like that. So one day, uh, ratings were given. And see, I used to, this was before I got married, I used to play poker and all like that with the gang. After I got married, I stayed because of children and all, and all that stuff. Well, all the men who played the poker got the, got the raise and the new rank. I didn't. So I bumped into a director of the computer division. I was now in the computer division. And I told him I was going to leave the computer division. And he said, why? And I told him. I said, if you think I'm, I said, I have more knowledge than half of those people there. And if you think I'm going to take this kind of crap, you got another guest coming. He said, don't do anything. The next day I got everything they did. And that my immediate superior hated me. He gave me the worst review I got in a lifetime. And they could hear me. We were in a glass, glass to office. Mm -hmm. And everybody heard me in that office. I told them what I thought of them, and everything else. And I said, if you think I'm going to just accept this, you got a, uh, you're mistaken. I wrote a 12-page letter of what I knew and my knowledge and what my knowledge is doing for the company. And I said, I, he, because he didn't like what I pulled, he's, he's persecuting me. And I send that to the highest office. I, I, I'm not afraid. If you're a good worker and you have a lot of knowledge, you have power. 
here's an incident that happened. When I got, after my wife died, I was in the hospital for a week. I had all kinds of problems. <clears throat> after I recovered, I came back and I found out that everything's a mess. And they were blaming this one kid that was t took over from me. And I said, well, he's not, he's not really to blame. They're going to fire him. And I said, if you fire him, I'm going to take an early retirement. And I, and I said, it's your fault. You said before I went to the hospital that you were going to give us seven people to help. You didn't give us any. I'm here. I was there a week, and I'm here now. And you still haven't got the seven people. And Bruce was a good worker, except he'd like to do favors for people too often. And that was one of his faults. So I said, that's what I told him. I said, if you fire him, I'm going to take an early retirement. And I don't care what happens to your to the, the schedule. And so they didn't. And I got everything I finally wanted, and I got the thing done on time. Oh, yeah. I had a lot of problems. The same way with one, uh, I was designing something, and I told this department to give it to me before December the 15th. They didn't give it to me till January the 3rd. So I had to uh, break all kind of records to get it done, work overtime, and so forth. And then I gave it, to, we done tests on it. I gave it to the guy to review. Uh, he reviewed it, found out six months later it wasn't working right. So this guy wrote a letter to the top echelon that, you know, I screwed everything up. And so I was going to write the letter, but this woman who was my boss, she said, no, Al, I'll write this. <laughs> so I told her what happened. We gave samples to this big, uh, this manager's uh, people who were supposed to review it. They should have found it. We could have caught it six months ago. They didn't. So he, I wrote a letter back to go to this man and tell him what I did and how I presented it, and they were supposed to review it, and they didn't. Oh, no, I, I, I'm a fighter. So you have a, you have a great strength of character. Do you think that your time in the military affected that? Do you think it helped you be a what? stronger person? Because you, you have all, clearly you've always been that way, but do you think it, it made a difference having been in the uh, I don't know where it started. I think I wanted to do good all the time. And, I, and if I made a mistake, I would correct it. Uh, but if it was a mistake that, was, that could have been caught by somebody in review. Well, I was the same way with the Army. I told the lieutenants what I thought of them, whether they liked it or not. They couldn't do crap because I was a future <laughs> warrant officer. I wasn't an enlisted man nor an officer. I, I was a technician. But uh, I think maybe I developed it in the Army more than, more than otherwise. But I, I've been that way ever since. I'm, I, I'm not afraid to challenge anybody. I know I'm a hard worker, and I, I, I produce. A lot of these people that you go to work with, they go to coffee too often. One time, I, they, you know, they, these guys invited me, and I went. And, an hour, a uh, half hour already passed, and I said, I said, don't you guys go back to work? They said, oh, no, we'll just sit around a while yet. I said, well, I'm sorry. I have a lot of work to do. I can't, I can't do this kind of crap. And I left them. You know, you said you made a lot of friends when the, the people you met during the war, did you stay friends with them afterwards? Oh, yeah, I wrote to them. Uh, in fact, uh, now, because we're older, I get Christmas cards from their wives. You know, they're deceased now, most of them. I don't know. I don't know if any. There, there was, uh, there's some gentlemen, some guys that in Florida, they moved to Florida. I get Christmas cards from them. And I've got to write them because I, I go back and forth to Connecticut, so I haven't been kept. I haven't been keeping up with. Uh, Do you ever have reunions or? 
I never was in an army reunion. I was in uh, high school reunions and you know, you know, col college reunion. No. Did you use the GI Bill when you went to mm -hmm. college? Did you get money from the government when you went to college? Well, uh, uh, yes. Uh, I told you that my mother saved enough money. I had enough for at least two years, and I worked when I went to college. I worked in a factory, I worked in a grocery store, I worked as a bus boy, I did all kind of work. Uh, I'm trying to get to the point that you asked. The GI Bill. Hmm? The GI Bill. Did I, or the GI Bill? Yeah, when it came in, it made me very happy because it would pay for some of my stuff. And what I did, since the, uh, the college had uh, uh, places where we could live, but uh, I joined a fraternity, which didn't do too much for me. Uh, if you were in a fraternity, you could live in a fraternity house. Mm -hmm. But I, uh, I rented a room from Sarah Brown, a good old Irishman, funny, and she her husband died, so she had a home in Trenton. It had three good bedrooms, and she had a bedroom downstairs and, and a bathroom downstairs, and then there was a bathroom upstairs for all the boy, young men. And she rented it to all the college kids. So uh, that's where, uh, and I worked. See, I worked part-time, so I was there, but every Friday, <laughs> We, we would come home from work and we'd get a bucket of beer, of beer and pizza and we'd sit around the table talking and having pizza and drinking beer. And then on Sunday she would make a meal for us. We told her not to, but she would make a meal for us. For, there was one, two, three, there was five of us. And she wouldn't take anything, she wouldn't, we wouldn't take anything for the meal. But we, uh, I can't remember what I paid her. It was very nominal, really. But she had five. Let's say we paid $10 a week. That was $50 a week she would get. A nice woman. Sarah Brown passed away. She had some very beautiful antiques. Very beautiful. Yeah, I wrote to her a lot. She passed away. She was old when I, I met her. She must have been. We were in our 20s and 30s, and she was like in her 50s and 55, going on 60. Oh, ancient. Yeah, ancient. But uh, she, was, she was a wonderful woman. And the, the, before I met her, I was with a, another widow and her daughter, and I, I lived in the attic with four other guys. That was, she, they were nice to us too because we could keep stuff in the refrigerator if we wanted to. But it was a nice college town, Trenton. And the people were wonderful. Really, they were nice to us. I think your people are always wonderful. And I think maybe, you like people. Maybe, maybe this is why my experience is with people a lot. See, so uh, it, I don't mind it. And that's why I. I volunteered to uh, feed the hungry, poor, and homeless in Chicago. And I would, they would have three different meals, meatloaf, uh, beef stew, or uh, chili. So whatever they asked for, I'd make. I'd make a couple pots of it, things like that. But uh, I, I like people. I enjoy people. I, I uh, and some of them, I've met some people that, uh, that you know, I, I wouldn't want as a permanent friend, but they're people. So I have one, I, one last question that I usually ask people, and that is um, whether having military experience influenced your thinking about war or about the military. Well, yeah, I, I think what our government is doing is stupid. You know, we're trying to spread democracy, and you can't teach anybody democracy because you have to know their 